I think I'm quite interested in what uh, Tony Sharrock has presented. Uh, I'm not too sure I caught the methodology, quite, followed it quite closely, but it's something I would be very interested to read. And I don't know when the book uh, is coming out or whether there are some papers based on that that are already available somewhere that one can da uh, download. The specific question I have is uh, uh, why do you focus on the billionaires? Because the Forbes data set have used it to basically to try and look at uh, uh, how economic growth in Africa is generating more millionaires, but I looked at the millionaire numbers rather than the billionaire numbers. What happens if you drop the bar rather than looking at uh, billionaires, but you have a continuum from, say, a couple of millions to billions, and you try and plot that so that you don't lump Africa as one country, but you distinguish them to see what is happening? Thank you. Okay. Could you identify yourself? Who are you? My name is Nicholas Ngepa. I'm uh, with uh, Oxfam. And I'm also with the University of uh, Johannesburg. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much, Nicholas. Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> I have a, a question for Andrea. Um, you, you, you showed that education is the main driving force in, for Latin American inequality change. When I'm uh, looking at uh, surveys, uh, because in, in household surveys, normally we don't look so much at technical education, just regular education. But looking in, in Brazil, I was surprised to see a big jump uh, that no one is talking very much about on the trends of vocational education. And the, and the second thing is uh, when you mention you know, lack of land reform, etc., when you see uh, Piketty's book, you see um, you know, most of wealth is housing, urban housing. In the past, it was um, land, uh, you know, the inequality hold, uh, uh, wealth holdings. And... Um, <clears throat> And as I, sh I showed, uh, there seems to be a, a change in Brazil. I'm not very uh, um, secure about that. We're just starting to, to look at this data. And, but uh, a, a change in the wealth distribution in terms of housing. And so um, I would like to, 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 uh, to see your opinion. I also would like to, to ask Professor Shorox about you know these surveys, these household surveys, they are normally not they are not good to get top incomes, but they are reasonably good to get uh, housing information. So you can estimate uh, uh, housing uh, wealth from these surveys. So what, and of course not for the top ones, but uh, so to get your impression on uh, you know, how useful standard surveys are to capture you know, housing wealth, what is the... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Masa. So uh, the next uh, question we have, uh, we have two there, please. The microphone is heading towards you. The person who grabs it first gets the next question. Please Hi, identify uh, yourself, sir. So, uh, yes, uh, John Lendon Lane from Rutgers University. Um, my first question is regarding to the first paper, which uh, I'm very interested. During this period of time, during Latin America, there was um, the pursuit of low inflation policies. And I'd be interested, uh, you didn't touch on it as much, but how much did that play in the drop in the, the inequality that you observe? And it's sort of, my comment is, is that obviously high inflation affects people differently. And with low inflation, we also get higher quality of, of measurement. So there's sort of a, a double, uh, two questions here. Is how much improvement of measurement and the quality of the data that statistical agencies are generating nowadays is, is, co I mean, is, is causing or the, our statistical findings that inequality is changing? And, and how much do you think the um, low inflation policies uh, that some of the... Low inflation. Low inflation. So the l inflation targeting like Chile and Peru in the 2000s uh, started inflation targeting. And you know, 
is there any way that you could, from your data that you've got, could tell us how, what contribution that has had um, on, on your analysis? Okay, thank you, John. We'll take one more in the current round and they'll ask for some responses so we don't forget. So please identify yourself, sir. Um, my name is Jose Maria Larru, and came from uh, Universidad Ceu San Paulo in Spain. My question is for Andrea Cornia. Uh, this is just if you could span a little bit more the cases of Honduras and Costa Rica, because I think that they are both uh, a contra egalitarian trend uh, recently. So what happened in more, more wider in, in Central America, this is not following the, the example of, of the Conosur. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We'll come back for another round um, in a minute or two. So, gentlemen, questions on uh, Africa's billionaires versus millionaires, the uh, issue of land reform and housing wealth in uh, Latin America, uh, the uh, validity or worth of household surveys or not, um, the consequences of low inflation and the drop inflation for Latin American inequality and Honduras and Costa Rica, are they outliers and uh, what do we know? So, uh, Andrea, please. So, uh, the data which we have used to measure the educational improvements are general enrollment and secondary education. And that now I think that uh, uh, you raise a, an important feature because including in Europe, there is a big debate whether there should be a general secondary education or vocational secondary education. Now, in Italy, for instance, uh, there is a drive to, towards the reintroduction of vocational education in the secondary, which is what Germany does on a bigger scale than anybody else. So, uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, 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 haven't, I haven't really tried to do that. My guess would be that um, with the... the very rapid uh, technological change which is still uh, ongoing uh, and with uh, more limited progress in tertiary education, I mean, positive but gradual progress in tertiary education, uh, going back to some, I mean, at least for some of the po students' population to vocational education would have a positive effect. And I come from Bologna, a city where the most famous school was not the university, which is the oldest in Europe, but it was a mechanical school which is, uh, was not able to graduate the students because they would go away, they would be recruited instantaneously. And, um, and then the expansion of the educational system has gone in the past towards general education. So everybody has to go to the lycée, something like that. You know? Now, the land versus urban housing, I think that uh, is a good point. I mean, I, I'm familiar with the, the wealth surveys done by Jim Davis, Tony, Brandolini, and all that. And in fact, I was struck myself by seeing that 70, something like 67% of the wealth is represented by housing. So, and so the argument would be, well, land matters less because uh, the, in the total uh, uh, amount of wealth, uh, so let, let think me the houses doesn't matter if we give them land. That probably for the urban population would be okay, but for the rural population, I don't know. So if I go to uh, Paraguay, uh, Paraguay there is a major issue of, of land with actually with all these uh, bad brasiguajos uh, that they go in and then uh, occupy Manu Militari, the land to produce soldier for export, you know. And I think that Lugo tried to, to redistribute the land, but he did not have enough political muscle to do it. And I guess that uh, President Lula has become, at least in Europe, an icon. It's like Virgin Mary, uh, Lula, and then now also Pope Francis, you know. So uh, he, uh, in a way, apparently uh, probably wanted, I mean, I don't know, I don't know what went through his brain. But uh, I remember well that when he was campaigning, he had uh, promised to give land titles to now, of course, if you, many people, they also say, well, okay, and, and now Brazil is urbanizing, and so, so it's, it's becoming less of an issue. But, I mean, if you go to Guatemala, uh, uh, Honduras, uh, many of these countries, uh, a nice piece of land reform would be quite useful. Now, the, the issue of inflation, I think, is a very good point. And uh, inflation, we, uh, basically, inflation has been stabilized in the 90s, in the 80s and 90s. So, and of course, if you want to stabilize inflation, normally if you follow 
the standard IMF package, you basically repress the economy. You, you, you must adopt contractionary measures. And that, of course, are on, in a way they worsen inequality. So one could say, well, you know, the, the Washington Consensus did the dirty job of reducing inflation and balancing the books, and then let the others now do the good things. Now, during the 2000s, inflation has remained pretty low, now with the exception of Venezuela. And uh, uh, during, since 2010, Argentina, when uh, the country, basically the National Statistical Institute has been uh, 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 taken by the government and producing fake data. And so the rate of inflation in Argentina is about 30%, and the government continued to say it was 10%. Now, if you want to reduce inflation, if you don't use uh, administrative method, which may be useful uh, sometime or not, basically you have to use uh, contractionary monetary policies or contractionary fiscal policies, which will worsen inflation, which will worsen inequality. So now we tried econometrically, it doesn't come out anything significant. Now, the improvement of the data. Now, Latin America, contrary to Africa, for instance, because now I'm studying these problems in Africa, has a very good data set. So they said, like uh, the work done by Leonardo Gasparini and Guillermo Cruces uh, in uh, Universidad de la Plata in Argentina, is really to be recommended. So they, took, they went back. CEPAL has done a lot of good work as well. But I think that uh, what the, uh, the, Cep the La Plata people did, they took the surveys and they applied the same procedures for imputation. So, the, you know, and I think that... Uh, this uh, difference in procedures can explain up to two, three, four points in Gini. Eh? So if they use the same methodology, uh, then we have uh, reasonably good data from 1990 onwards. So I don't think that uh, there is uh, any uh, problem with uh, that concerning the service, except, uh, except for, uh, concerning financial wealth. Now with an open capital account, uh, if you are a rich Brazilian, you can export all the money you want. Probably you go to, to the Bahamas, no, to what? To the Virgin Islands, and, uh, and th that is the real issue now, I think, that uh, the issue of international taxation. Now, finally, uh, Central, America, Central America has been doing, on average, less well. Now, and uh, Costa Rica, which was like the icon of Central America, was like the good country, uh, people, they, uh, even this morning, Amartya Sen mentioned Costa Rica, no? Uh, but Costa Rica is one of the few countries in, in Latin America which had an increase in income inequality. And it also had a, a shift in political regime towards uh, the center-right, towards a more conservative regime. And I think that that is not the problem. But the problem is that, uh, I mean, the economy is moving towards manufacturing, and so, uh, so perhaps uh, the uh, Kuznets model here applies. You know. Now, Honduras had uh, a bad distribution, worsening distribution until 2005, and then an improvement uh, from there onward. And El Salvador, which fought a civil war which ended in 2001, I think, 2002, and uh, uh, basically had a very, very large uh, improvement in equality with the APRA party, which is a very conservative party. I mean, I think the prime minister was one of the guy uh, leading the, the death squad or something like that, you know. So, and then, so, it was very difficult to explain how inequality fell in El Salvador. And I think that what the authors of the case studies show is that uh, migration, migration, I think migration has been, uh, and normally in theory, you know, in theory, you know, the hump theory of migration says migration is disequalizing. But now, so many El Salvadorians have gone to abroad that, uh, so now even the poor migrate. So, so remittances tend to uh, accrue also to, to poor families. And also the amount of people who has left uh, you know, has reduced the number of unskilled labor who are available in the economy. So if you have a, a migration of the Salvadorian scale, then you can have a very large reduction of income inequality with almost no impact of the CCT type program, which I've been very, very modest. Okay. Thank you, Andre. Tony. Um, thanks. Um, first question about why do we use billionaires rather than millionaires. I, maybe I wasn't clear enough. <clears throat> I used billionaires because that's the only data we have. Um, if, there was, if, if there was estimates of the number of millionaires in the world, that's what I would use. Um, but there are, I think, something, our estimates are, there's something like uh, 
30 million uh, dollar millionaires in the world, you, you're not going to get uh, you're not going to get accurate numbers on that. The billionaires, though, you know, this someone sits down and puts resources and does some reasonably accurate, uh, I think, uh, estimates. Um, Sometimes, I mean, the Forbes, Forbes. If you read the Forbes. Uh, pages and so on, they even have people sending in their certified accounts, I mean, to Forbes. Um, some people are so vain uh, that they want to make sure they're on the list and stay on the list. Um, and it's, you know, these are, if there's a relatively small number, what uh, we're talking about, what, um, 1,500 or something billionaires in the world. So the, uh, you know, we're talking about modest numbers and uh, presumably they have quite good estimates of people who are quite close to the, to the billionaire range. We use that, we use the billionaire as their observation, but then we use, uh, we assume it's a Pareto distribution, so all you need with a straight line is two points. Um, and one of them is the billionaires and one of them is distribution. So we just fit it to the, you know, we're just saying, assume it has a Pareto tail at some point and assume that the billionaire data is correct. Then I can generate estimates for everything. I, we just, we estimate What's the number with 100 million? What's the number of 10 million? What's the number of millionaires for every country in the world? It's, uh, it's what we do every year, and we've been doing it. Um, it's just now we've got a more consistent way, I think, to, to avoid you know, year-on-year -year variations, which are uh, a, a bit erratic. I also have to say you know, we, we generate th those numbers. We also generate now the median wealth in each country in the world uh, back to the year 2000 in, in a sort of comparable way. So, uh, obviously, for African countries, uh, there's very few that have billionaires, but quite a few, pretty well all of them, are going to have some millionaires, and we will give those numbers um, clearly. Um, it's the countries which have more, uh, where they have better data, when you get to a point where you've got no billionaires, you've got no uh, wealth distribution, you've got no wealth data, um, you know, you're, you're limited in what confidence you can have in the numbers, but we try our best to get the best estimate based on, on, on what we have, the information we have available. The second question about housing, I think it's, it's an interesting one. The, the problem, um, uh, as it ha turns out, the, uh, the evidence suggests that people are actually quite accurate in, in when you ask surveys and they ask them their housing wealth, they're quite good at responding indeed the estimates, uh, the evidence suggests that they actually even give inflated values, um, that so the numbers you get out of maybe 5 or 10% higher than the, the true value of their housing. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence. Uh, I, I, you know, there's various people that have done studies to, to compare that. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not housing wealth that's uh, underreported, and the whole real wealth is probably isn't the problem area, it's financial wealth and it's to do with, and particularly, even worse, I think, debts. I mean, people do not tell people how much they owe. Um, so you get, uh, this is where you have the problem areas. Um, the problem, though, is if you're looking at that as a trend, because the housing wealth is only, uh, uh, is housing, um, non-financial wealth globally is uh, around about 45% of the total now. Uh, historically, what's happened is that in the year 2000, financial wealth was about 55% of gross wealth, 40, 55 to 45. The ratio then went down until they were pretty well equal in the year two, uh, around about the crisis. In fact, I think there was one year in which financial wealth um, went below non-financial wealth. But since uh, 2008, uh, non-financial wealth has been pretty flat globally, and it's... Uh, it's financial wealth that's, that expanded. So there's, the gap has gone up to roughly what it was before. It's interesting uh, because of the, as I told you, these trends that it looks like inequality went down up to the crisis and then it's gone up again. This is exactly what you'd expect uh, on the basis of portfolio differences because richer people have a higher proportion of financial assets. So if financial assets are declining relative, if asset prices are changing such that financial assets are, are losing value, then you'd expect that to be equalizing. And if financial assets are going up, which they have been. This last year, we're just about to, the report this year, stock markets have been booming. This is, this is 
the last uh, 12 months or 18 months have been probably uh, the biggest rise in personal wealth in the globe ever. Uh, you know, it's just, and stock markets have just soared. The US, which rose last year by 22%, is the median. I mean, it's actually just slightly below the median for the countries in the world. More than half the countries did better than 20% increase in market capitalization. So we had this huge increase in, in financial assets, but this has been true since the financial crisis. It's just booming. It's interesting because, uh, because of um, sort of Piketty's uh, uh, intervention has, has raised questions about what is happening globally. And one suggestion is, uh, and this is uh, really quite relevant, I think, to the, the discussion here. One suggestion is income inequality has gone up. So more of income has gone to richer people. Richer people don't spend as much. So what do they do with this extra cash? They look around for investments. So they've been channeling this extra money that's, uh, that's been coming along. They've been channeling into investments. What's that done? It's driven down interest rates. And they, you look at interest rates since 1980, they're just declining. We're, in, we're now at historically low interest rates, as we know. But of course, if interest rates are low, are low asset prices go up. So housing prices go up and also uh, uh, all stock markets. So you could think that what has been happening, and this is uh, the macroeconomic effects uh, of uh, increasing inequality, is that it's, drive it's been driving down interest rates, driving up asset prices, which is then, of course, fed back to the people that own the assets. Um, of course, what's happened at the low end, the people who don't have such high incomes, they've been, everyone else has, has been galloping ahead, they haven't, uh, their income has not been going up, so what have they been doing? They've been borrowing more, so this increase in debt uh, has been fueled. Uh, the people that have benefited are funding, uh, they're actually um, uh, lending the money to the people who, who, uh, who have not done so well, and, and they're just uh, building up debt. And again, you know, you've only got to look at all these things. This is, this is what's happening, and this is really one, one of the worries uh, in the world, that whether this sort of trends can be sustained. And of course, all of this also is funded a little bit by quantitative easing by the central banks, because they are buying up all these assets and forcing down these interest rates. So when all this comes to an end, uh, we don't really know, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see whether the whole thing unravels or whether or not, uh, uh, you know, whether there's a, another option. Thank you, Tony. Um, since we started late, we, we've got a little bit of time to take out of the coffee break, but um, if we could have another very quick round. Um, please uh, be very concise and pointed in your questions. So I'll, I'll take three, three more. So the gentleman over there, please. If we get the microphone to the gentleman there, if you could identify yourself. Uh, I've had no female questioners <laughs> so far, and I've got two males lining up. Uh, so I'm going to take the next one over there. So please identify yourself. Sir. Hi, I'm Juha Honkila from Statistics Finland. First of all, I would like to congratulate my former boss from 96, Andrea, for a very interesting presentation. Glad to see you're still doing fine. My question is to Tony Sharks. Now, I appreciate a lot what you're doing. It seems an impossible task to construct a global distribution of wealth. Now, you have data limitations, and you were discussing about financial and non-financial wealth. My question is on the estimation of real wealth. To my understanding, there are very little countries which have balance sheet data on non-financial assets. And even worse, I've looked at your report, the countries for which you have balance sheet data on real assets are countries which have relatively low home ownership rates, like Germany, Netherlands, France. And you use this data to estimate the real wealth for countries which have much higher home ownership rates. So my question is, how do you account for the differences in home ownership rates? Because for this, you have really good data. Okay, thank you, Joa. Okay, if we could take the lady now at the back, if you could identify yourself, please. 
Hi, um, I'm Tanya Ponsan Krajang from Chulalongkorn University in Thailand. Um, I have one response um, to the second presentation. Um, I think the wealth um, pyramid is really interesting, mainly because I've been interacting with demographers. And um, I'm not sure whether we can borrow some of that techniques. For example, um, right now in that pyramid, um, in each layer, not only the number of the population that's shown, um, also, um, at some other category, categories like um, proportion of people who finish um, secondary education or proportion of people with a um, certain level of asset holding such as land holding. So I'm not sure um, how much contribution that would be, but it may be interesting to show other dimensions of um, inequalities within the pyramid as well. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'm going to take one last question. I'm going to go eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and I'm going to take James Foster at the very front. So, microphone to James Foster, please. Apologies, sir, but you, you will be able to ask uh, over the coffee break. Uh, James, James, there we are. <laughs> now, hello. Uh, yes, uh, one, one thing that I was interested in was in the first talk, Andrea, everything comes down to education. And in the second talk, nothing comes down to education. In other words, education or human capital isn't included in your definition of wealth, but as you know and remark in the report, it's three times the value of the wealth, the wealth that you're, you're talking about. Has there been any discussion or uh, attempt to incorporate education as part of wealth per se, human capital as part of wealth per se? Uh, so that's my, my main question. I'll just ask two other little questions. Um, is it really appropriate to use the Lorenz curve to measure wealth inequality, or should some absolute notion be used instead? So that's just one of my measurement questions. I've been thinking about that for a long time, that wealth is different than inequality, being stock versus flow, lots of other things. Um, yes, and zeros are there as well, and negatives like crazy. So these are, are really big problems. Um, and then finally, just in terms of Education. You are using schooling, schooling clearly for your discussion of education and equality. Uh, is there anything on the front of, of in introducing quality into those numbers? Okay, thank Cheers. You, Thanks. I'm actually going to sneak the gentleman there back in because he nearly got the microphone, so he deserves to ask the question. <laughs> Please identify yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Yan uh, Wu from Australia. Uh, just a very briefly comment on the billionaire number. I think that the a, this number is very small in each country, so if someone becomes a bankrupt, then uh, it has created a lot of distortion. B, those guys are also very mobile, they can change their nationality any time. Uh, I'm thinking whether it's better to look at the other side of the uh, distribution, say the, the poorest are 10% or 5% instead of the richest are 1%. The number of, the, say, five, the poorest are 5% in each country. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so back to the panel for some very brief uh, responses. First, um, let's start with Tony first. Tony. Thank you. Um, okay, let's just... Um, the first question about real assets and whether, whether there's a bias there to countries which have low home ownership rates. I'm not quite sure how... I don't think we'd really uh, bias that, and I'm not quite sure... Um, I, I think we might think about that question rather than... Uh, uh, it's something which we do throw in other variables, so there's a sense in which we may pick that up. Um, we are all the time, I think, trying to revise our numbers and see whether we can improve, but uh, you know, we are at least limited by the fact, uh, by what uh, data is available. So um, I'm, I'm sure in 20 years' time, people will be doing much better than we are, but in the, at the meantime, we'll, we'll do what we can and we'll just sort of keep adjusting, but we'll think about that and see whether we can uh, add some other variables in, I think, to uh, see what uh, difference it makes. Um, the wealth pyramid question about whether we can have other dimensions, in, in a sense, we do uh, in our report. We have... For example, we give a breakdown by regions, and so we could easily break it down uh, by lots of other, other factors. We don't have any... Remember here, we're, um, I told you right at the beginning, we're generating a synthetic database. 
So we do not have any other characteristics of individuals. Um, you can go back and you can, you can generate for, for countries where we do have uh, survey data, we could get that, but otherwise we don't. Um, so we're a bit limited there. Uh, of course, if you want to take a country which, uh, and go and process their wealth data, then you would be able to do other things as they, as they do. Um, so um, I'm not sure we don't, if we had other dimensions, uh, what we'd like m more than anything, I think, is age, uh, because we don't, we're, we just have uh, uh, no information other than, we, we're just generating what we think is a number, and we, we don't even break that down by age. But we would like to do it by age, we'd probably like to do it by gender, uh, and then we might get on to things like education level, but that's a, a long way ahead. Um, about uh, James's question about human capital, this is this always comes up really. I mean, how you define ca wealth? Um, if you start to sort of add in human capital, you get something which is almost a sort of um, annuitized version of income. Um, and so, I think there is an advantage for keeping the thing separately. The usual definition is something that's marketable. Um, the, quest the questions about definition are tricky and often. Uh, the, the trickiest question is to do with what you do about pension wealth um, and because there's different sorts of pension wealth there's, there's uh, funded pension, state pensions versus private pensions and um, so there's that is a really kind of complex area I, you know, if you can, if you like add in, cap, we don't you can add in these other things but at the end of the day you say is that really helping you understand the world um, on the whole I think people do um, have an interest in the wealth of people, what their assets are, what they're doing with it, um, how they've made their wealth, and uh, that is what we try to respond to. Um, as James also mentioned, though, that the wealth inequality is interesting because we can have negative numbers, and in fact we do get quite a few negative numbers, and indeed negative numbers are growing um, more countries are having negative numbers and part of that is there's lots of debts at the bottom payday loans, student debts are getting enormous in lots of countries um, uh, and if in the, the, one of the problem countries we've had is Denmark because they have 30% of their population has negative wealth and indeed if you look at the Lorenz curve it doesn't actually go above it doesn't go above the x-axis until you get into the 60th or 70th percentile. And it gives you a genie more than 100. At least we, we did have. Um, that was partly our processing. But if you look at the report last year, you'll find that Denmark has a genie of 105 or something. And we get people writing to us all the time saying, it can't be right. The genie you know, is between 0 and 100. Of course, that is true. It, we're not using the Lorenz curve anymore, I'm just, I've just told you. <laughs> so there's a sense in which uh, moving to this sort of diagram in which we're plotting, uh, we're plotting this curve is, is much more along the lines that you're suggesting. Um, um, if you wanted to keep it in terms of wealth rather than wealth relative to the mean at the bottom, then you know, you'd be able to plot what's happening over time and seeing wh how the curve is shifting. But if you're interested in analysing inequality and inequality trends and trying to, let's say, combine, uh, combine the, use the Forbes-type top-tailed information for different years, <coughs> then I think um, I would recommend that one goes ahead in the way that I've um, proposed. Um, um, thank you. Uh, I've just the, uh, the last then? question yeah. was about uh, billionaires. Yes, there's a small number. There were, I, again... We, we don't, uh, we're not interested just in billionaires. I'm just using it as a, as a point, as a sample point. Um, it's used as saying, we're treating it as, as if it's accurate. It is true that, uh, you know, that people can move around. On the whole, we use the Forbes, the Forbes definition is, is on their, um, what, what their nationality is, not where they're resident. So that if, they, if people move to a different country, the Forbes data doesn't treat Abramovich as a UK billionaire, the Sunday Times does uh, in, in crude terms. Um, and we, we're taking the uh, citizenship definition largely because that seems to be more relevant in terms of 
if we're using that as a predictor of how, you know, what the wealth is in that country, uh, the few people at the top who happen to move to another country, that's, you know, they made their money in wealth in, in Russia. That's where you know, the other big wealth holders are like to be. Some of them will have moved, that's true. But uh, it, we, I think the, uh, it's, it's a big problem for Russia. It's a big problem for um, India, I think. There's, a, there's quite a few uh, transient uh, Indians. Um, uh, and uh, I think probably will be, you know, I can, I can imagine it being a problem for other countries as well in the future. So this issue about, uh, as I mentioned, is one which I think uh, will have to be addressed in the future. Okay, thank you, Tony. So, uh, Andrea, any brief responses before yeah. we break for coffee? Yes, I think that, uh, I mean, what, what we... Oh, sorry. Is it on? No, not like that. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> I think that the, the, the Latin American story boils down not only to education, because there, is, there are also policies in the labor market, taxation, public expenditure, macroeconomics, and so on and so forth. But basically, the educational policies followed already since the 1990s. Basically, they, they affected very strongly the distribution of human capital, and therefore the, 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 the ratio between skilled and unskilled wages, because they increased the number of people with uh, sufficient education. Now, the quality of education, maybe we don't have data, they're not easy to measure because we don't have a distribution, we have tests but you don't have then a distribution of people with the quality taken in, into consideration. But I think that one of the arguments is that uh, the quality of education has been falling, as we, I think that has been uh, shown, because massification of education, and that may have contributed to the decline of the uh, uh, wages in the, of the skilled laborers. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, um, Andrea. So it remains for me to thank uh, our two excellent speakers who have certainly given us a lot of food for thought to adjourn for uh, coffee. Um, remember that the next uh, sessions uh, will begin shortly. And uh, when you next get a call from Forbes reminding you to fill in that billionaire <laughs> form, please do it accurately. Okay, thank you very much.